A farmer depends on himself and the land and the weather. You're a farmer. You raise what you eat. You raise what you wear. And you keep warm with wood out of your own timber. You work hard, but you work as you please. And no man can tell you to go or come. You'll be free and independent, son, on a farm. That's the almost the end of Farmer Boy, which I can't believe this was the first time I've actually ever read Farmer Boy. Uh, growing up, I was a girl. I focused on Laura and Mary and Carrie and Grace and all them and completely skipped over all mine. So I figured that's a boy's book. I don't need to read it. And so this year I read it to my boys and it was just a really wonderful read. If you haven't read it, I suggest it. One of the little house books, Farmer Boy. I want you to get started homesteading right where you are. And it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in a 10th floor apartment in the middle of Chicago and you can get started on homesteading and living a life that takes care of what you've been given and helps you to go further and to provide yourself and to be free and independent. So I wanted to take a few minutes. You know me, it'll be more than a few minutes. And I wanted to show you about nine ways. There's probably gonna be a couple bonus ways that you can start homesteading right where you're at today. See you on the other side of the intro. Let's imagine that you have absolutely no homesteading skills. You have no idea what you would even, how you would even start. And yet you want to get started. You want to try something new. You want to become more free and independent. You want to be a little bit more self-reliant. You don't want to live your life serving others just because you've been told that you have to. Let's look at a few ways that you can do that. All right? All right. When we first got started homesteading, I didn't think of it as homesteading. I thought of it as learning a couple new skills. And honestly, looking back, some of the skills that I value very much as a homesteader I really did not consider them a homesteading skill in the least. If I had to go all the way back to some of my most beginning skills, it, one of them was learning to sew. Now, sewing is a very valuable thing in the homestead, and I'll get to that, but that's not where everyone starts. Everyone starts in a way that's different. Everyone starts in a way that's different. What I recommend is that you find the thing that's the most important to you, okay? Whether that's food, whether that's security on your, you know, personal security, um, whether that's skills, learning how to do things, whether that's getting into the dirt, whether that's raising animals, whatever's the most important to you and hone in on just that get yourself one or two interests and I don't say goals. I'll probably say goals later because I've forgotten I said don't say goals. But really, goals don't lead me where I want to be. Interests lead me. I was interested in sewing and so I started to sew. I was interested in making cheese. So I learned how to make cheese. Whatever is interesting you, that's where I want you to start. Okay? All right, now I'm gonna go through a few things that you can do no matter where you are. All right, number one, no matter where you are, you can learn how to cook from scratch. I've even got props. This is my grandma's um, recipe box. And in here are many of her recipes, a couple of mine, a couple from friends, a couple from books. And these are all things that they're written down. They're not just on my phone. 
recipes that have been tested that I use frequently. And if I can't find something in the store, I can go to my recipe uh, box or my couple recipe books that I have in the cupboard and I can find a way to recreate that at home. I've got recipes for tortillas, recipes for bread, recipes for all sorts of stuff. And learning how to cook from scratch is one of the very first homesteading skills that you should learn. Um, if you're interested in learning how to bake, um, I have a video that's on my baking day where I bake about six loaves of bread uh, every week and sometimes pies, sometimes crackers, sometimes, um, sometimes cookies or other good things. But in that video, I do explain how I make it work for us and uh, it's great. Cooking from scratch is one of the first homesteading skills that I suggest anybody learn um, if you haven't already learned it in your adult life. Now, if you've already learned this in your adult life, guess what? You have taken your first step toward free and independent homesteading life. Skill number two. We're going to go with food for a little while and then we'll get into some other skills. If you already know how to cook fairly well and you want to step it up a notch, I recommend learning about different methods of preserving. Okay, you do not have to grow a garden in order to preserve the food that you have, okay? If you've got bulk bins, if you go to uh, food pantries because you need to go to food pantries, I've been there, no biggie. If you go to food pantries and you get a whole heck of a lot of apples that you just can't eat fast enough or the tomatoes got a couple bad spots on them, not exactly great for burgers. What else are we going to do for them? There are several different ways of food preservations and the top, let's see, there are three or four. I'll figure it out once I start saying it. Canning, drying, freezing, and um, pickling or um, fermenting okay this one's kind of a, a little bit of a different one uh, not everything works to be pickled or fermented but I mean you could try it might hurt it might not all right so learning how to can I do have a video on poor man's rebel canning so if you have none of the materials needed for canning go check that one out because it gives you a very basic rundown how to do something very simple. I did an example on uh, cranberry sauce and I recommend that you try um, to replace two things that you buy at the store already canned. Two things that you buy at the store already canned or already frozen. I recommend that you get two of those items. For example, whole cranberry sauce and replace it with a homemade version. Ta-da! Homemade cranberry sauce. You can adjust the sugar as needed, make it healthier for you, and uh, cheaper for you if you get things on sale, etc. So if you can replace two things that you get at the store with a homemade version, then you are a huge step forward in your homesteading journey. Personally, some of the very first things that I decided to start preserving instead of purchasing were tomato products and pickles. Pickles, because my grandma made the best pickles in the world and I wanted to be just like her. Tomato sauce, because we use like three quarts a week of different tomato stuff and it made a huge difference to us. So if you can replace something you buy at the store, with something you homemade, that's a good step. On to the next food item. And this dips into the um, fermenting. If you go to the store and you get a whole bag of apples and you cut those apples up for your kids, what do you do with the peels and the cores? Okay, your kids eat the peels, fantastic gold star. Do they eat the cores? Probably not. All right, what I want you to do is consider saving the cores from your peaches, pears, and apples, and any peels too. Um, you can stick them in the freezer for a while 
until you've got enough and consider making your own vinegars. Vinegars are natural up here at the top. This is the mother. This is very healthy. This is actually a pear vinegar and they're very simple. I don't think I've made a video on that yet, but I should. Now, if you don't want to wait for me to make one, find Three Rivers Homestead because she makes vinegars and um, she'll have all the great instructions. Vinegars are an excellent way for you to get into more of your homemade goods. These are fantastic in salad dressings. I actually just like to drink it because I'm that weirdo. And vinegar. You can even get to the next step with that vinegar, which is cheese making. All right. You do not have to have a cow or a goat to make cheese. What you have to have is milk. I make all sorts of dairy and I do have a video on my dairy day <clears throat> with store-bought milk. Store-bought whole milk. I usually buy several gallons, uh, about six or seven gallons of milk a week. Um, some we use just for drinking and then the others I use for making different dairy products. I make yogurt and then out of the yogurt I save some for yogurt some for ranch dressing, and then I make cream cheese and sour cream out of some of it as well. You, I also make mozzarella, which is an easy cheese, which I use my homemade vinegars for. Um, and I make hard cheeses. I'm going to be super honest here. I have been using too much rennet in my cheese, but I'm just letting you know that because we all live and learn. So this cheese, this particular one, probably not going to be consumed by the humans. It's probably going to go to our chickens. But that's part of learning. Now, it did firm up pretty nice. I am pretty proud of this. But the red it makes gives it a little bit of an off taste. So, while completely edible, you live and learn. Making dairy is a very excellent way to learn some homesteading skills. Um, I do have that Dairy Day video, and if you're looking for further resources, Venison for Dinner is a really good one. She teaches a lot of stuff. All right. I did mention chickens, but I don't want to get to them yet. Another thing that you can do, no matter where you are, I'm talking high rises, I'm talking your mom's basement, I am talking anywhere. You've got 20 acres of land haven't done anything with, you can do that here too. Uh, dehydrating. And these are just orange peels from oranges that we had and I wanted to have some orange peel on hand for orange zest for muffins and things like that. And so just pop it in the dehydrator. These actually only took a few hours, so pretty fast in regards to dehydrating. But you can dehydrate all, all sorts of stuff. If you can find something that um, you want to replace with a home dehydrated product, that's great. But I find that dehydrating is best when I have just a little bit left of something that I don't know what to do with. I accidentally grew way too many cherry tomatoes this year, and cherry tomatoes are kind of hard to make spaghetti sauce with, so I cut them all in half, dehydrated them about halfway, and then soaked them in herbs and oil and had like sun-dried tomatoes which were fantastic. Um, anytime I have a little bit of extra applesauce, I dehydrate that and make fruit roll-ups. If you've got um, a few grapes at the bottom of the bag that nobody wants to eat because they're just a little bit wrinkly, not moldy, wrinkly, throw them in. You got some raisins for your oatmeal the next morning. Dehydrators are very um, set it and forget it, not a whole lot of knowledge needed and a really good way to start into food preservation if you're a little bit nervous about all the technical ways of doing it. All right. We've gone over most of the food stuff. If everybody focuses on the food in homesteading because when it comes down to it, our whole lives are about getting food procuring food, eating food, using the food, and going out to procure more food. 
I don't care what you do in a day. If you go to a school and you teach children and you get paid every couple weeks or every month and you go to the store and then you buy food and you pay your electric bill that you use to cook the food and you pay for your gas bill that you used to drove to get the food, you get it. Everything's about food, but sometimes it's not. Let's go a slightly different route, all right? And then we're gonna cycle back to the chickens and stuff. Because that's more like homesteading 201, I think. No matter where you live, you can learn skills that will help you to become more and free and independent. And my personal opinion is that being able to identify the things that surround you is one of those most important skills. And so therefore, I recommend getting as many good guidebooks for your local area as you possibly can. Learning how to forage. Yes, just like a squirrel. Learning how to forage is a wonderful tool in a homesteader's um, survival belt because it's good to know and honestly, it's fun. Being able to walk on those trails and get some exercise and find a couple gallons of uh, oyster mushrooms, bonus. We're still uh, eating our oyster mushrooms that we found this summer. So, but it's not real safe to just pick any mushroom or any berry and think that you can eat it. Um, I am in Iowa, and so I have this book called Mushrooms of the Upper Midwest. This book is really good. It has some pretty simple ones, top edibles, top poisonous that you want to um, avoid, or well, top toxics, I should say. And it has decent pictures. You want good pictures. And you want to learn thoroughly before you start foraging things like mushrooms or berries, okay? Because there are things that can hurt you. But knowing these can be really helpful. So there's mushrooms. There are edible wild plants. This one's called the Forager's Harvest. I find this one very helpful. It goes over lots of different kinds of plants and how to use them. And it's kind of like North America but not really any particular part of North America. So it should pretty much um, fit most of my viewers here. So they've got good pictures and explanations. That's a good one. This one is not, these two are not quite the same um, because you can't eat them. Well, maybe you could, but trees and flowers. Trees and flowers, there we go. Um, knowing what sorts of trees are around you, including black walnut. Yes, you can eat black walnuts. They're foraged in my pantry right now. Um, and also knowing that other things don't like to grow around black walnuts. So you might not want to plant your garden right underneath it. And, uh, what sort of wildflowers you have so that you know what sort of soil you have. Learning how to identify Flowers and trees are also very helpful. I'm going to set that back. You can learn how to forage no matter where you are. If you've got city parks, if you've got parking lots that you are fairly sure haven't been sprayed. Um, neglected parking lots are awesome. Um, playgrounds. Lots of things grow near playgrounds like mushrooms and stuff. So... It's not going to kill you if you know which one it is. Nobody's going to stop you. <laughs> Might as well forage. That's actually the funny. I find it funny. I taught my kids how to forage different things. And so now whenever we go somewhere in the summer, like if we go to a playground, they skip the playground at first. The first like 10, 15 straight minutes are purely looking for the things that they want to eat. Black raspberries. Oyster mushrooms for later. Um, black walnuts, um, <laughs> looking for Creeping Charlie, looking for, I, I could go on and on. I just find it funny. If you can teach your kids how to do these things, then that's excellent stuff for them to know too. 
the next thing that admittedly you do need to have a little bit of space for this but you don't need that much is growing stuff all right so I do have a book called the kitchen garden it's an older book but I really love it it goes over um, different plants and their needs um, for example leeks Half hardy to very hardy biennial, known only in cultivation, da 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 da. It explains what to expect from them, how to use them, how to grow them, um, where to plant them, how to harvest them, and uh, how to cook maybe. Learning how to garden is going to be one of your really important skills before you take the next step. You can start with potted plants in your windowsill. You can even grow them in your bathroom with a grow light. You can, honestly, you can grow plants anywhere. If you've got a balcony, um, grow them there. If you are like us, we lived in an apartment building and the apartment manager was totally fine with us starting a community garden. And so we dug up um, a pretty sizable plot in the yard and put in six different plots so that six different families could use the garden at the same time. And ours was only 10 by 10. But the soil was top notch. And we got a ton out of that garden and so did the other families involved. And now that garden is an established garden that's been... How many years has it been now? Four years now? It's an established garden, even though we do not live in those apartments anymore. None of the original tenants still live there, and the management has even switched over, but that garden remains. And so that's allowed for more food security for the people in that apartment complex. So you never know. It never hurts to ask. This is the second time in my life that we've been able to do um, a community garden at an apartment complex. Just because this is an apartment doesn't mean you're not allowed to grow some tomatoes. If you need some help learning how to start seeds, or if you're worried, I don't really have the money to get all the seed setups and everything, blah, 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 blah. I have a video that kind of explains what we can do. These are Anaheim peppers. They have not sprouted yet because I only planted them about five days ago. Um, but learning how to grow your own food is going to be a huge leap forward in your homesteading journey. And you really can do that no matter where you are. Save the chickens for last. Save the chickens for last. Save the chickens for last. We'll get to them. My next to last skill that I did mention earlier is sewing. Learning how to repair things instead of buying new is going to save you a ton of money. It will give you a hobby during the winter when you're kind of just sitting there picking your nose and waiting for spring. Um, sewing is very helpful. You, If you get good enough at it, you can trade your services for other things um same with other needlework crochet knit blah 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 if you are good enough at it then you can make or fix things for people and then trade that for whatever they have so trading kind of gets worked into that as well sewing is not a difficult skill to learn um if you're sewing by hand i recommend watching a video on simple sewing by hand seams, um, patching small holes in the knees of pants, things like that. Just try. You never know. You might love it. If you are going to be sewing with a sewing machine and it's your first time doing it, I recommend first look for a YouTube video on your brand of sewing machine and just watch the tutorial. And then I recommend sewing a pillowcase. Two or three straight lines and you've covered a pillow. Very, very simple. Teaches you a lot of the basics. Lining up fabric, ironing, making sure that you sew the printed sides together and then turn it 
out so that the printed sides have the nice seams and the ugly side is on the inside. Well, this is a bad example. It's double-sided. So, sewing is a skill that I definitely teach my kids. Um, they're just beginning at it, but they could whip something out if they needed to. And you can do that no matter where you are. Again, high-rise, low-rise, tunnel under the ground. If you live with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you can sew them new bandanas. Okay? All right. Getting into probably my last little thing on getting started homesteading where you are. This is my last one because it's not going to work for everybody. If you have a homeowners association or a nosy neighbor that dislikes you, I recommend taking a different route. But if you can research your city's ordinances and find out that you can indeed have a backyard flock of laying hens, then these lovelies can be yours for the uh, cost of feed and table scraps. I end up paying about uh, $16 a month for my chicken feed um, because I do a whole lot of table scraps for my chickens. I have 11 chickens. Right now in February, we're getting about seven eggs a day, but in the summer, it'll be 11. And so the I get nearly a dozen every day or every other day, depending on the season. So really, cost works out for me. Taking care of chickens is a lot of fun, too. It's great to teach kids responsibility. And um, it's kind of relaxing. Go out there, talk to the chickens that can't talk back. It's not a whole lot of uh, places you can do that when you're a mom. <laughs> now, not everywhere can you have chickens. And then, like me, I want a cow so bad, but I have an eighth of an acre. I have a backyard and a front yard. That's what I got right now. Cow or goats or any of that are not happening for me. But I can get involved with other people who are more established and have more land and more resources and I can trade skills for food or food for skills and I uh, I don't have room for a whole bunch of fruit trees but I have neighbors and friends that do have fruit trees and no time to pick it so I go over prune their trees pick their fruit can it and then give them a portion of it back for growing the fruit and I keep the majority of it for picking and processing. Being able to trade like that is a skill that you need to learn homesteading too. Um, so you can do that with things like meat and pigs and chickens and dairy and eggs and things like that. If you do not have the ability to do it on site that's okay. We're not necessarily called to do all of it now. You can find a farmer that wants to sell their beef. Great. You got a freezer, load it up. Uh, if you're not there yet, that's fine too. They got beef at Aldi. You can get it there too. You can learn to can that beef when it's on sale. Back to canning. I recommend that you go ahead and find whatever really interests you and whatever you're really passionate about and just absolutely dive into that. If food is your thing, you've got no stopping point in homesteading. It just keeps going. Got canning figured out, got dehydrating figured out, got fermenting figured out and freezing. Guess what? We're going to freeze dry. I, I'm not getting into that yet. That's a little advanced for me, for me even. My mom used to work at a freeze-drying plant. And that is what I think of every time someone freeze-dries something. I'm like, my mom used to work at a factory where they did this. Like, that used to be a factory. And now it's shrunk down. Just like these computers used to take up the entire wall of a room. 
and now they're shrunk down to fit in your hand. It just blows my mind, so I'm not quite there yet. I gotta get over that mental hurdle of how can I have a freeze drying factory in my kitchen? All right, start where you are. Become free and independent. Really grab hold of that and make that decision and find people who are good mentors. And if there's nobody in person, come find me. I love to talk about this stuff. This stuff is just the thing that gives me energy and passion in life. The reason I have all of this is because I'm interested in so many of it and I just love it. So I hope that this has been um, a good video and has given you a few places to start. Uh, find me on Instagram and Facebook um, if you want to chat one-on-one. -on -one. Comment on this because I also love talking on YouTube. Um, if you needed some mentorship, come chat with me. I don't get paid for any of this, guys. It's just fun. So, um, hit me up. All right, guys. Love you much. God bless you. And uh, happy homesteading. We'll see you next week.